So, um, good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> As we all say, it's, it's a pleasure to be here and an honor. Um, what, what I intend to do is, I view this really as a workshop, okay? So the idea is to have a dialogue with you and uh, follow your lead. After presenting, well, certain highlights on the experience of a clinician in the field using cannabis. My name is Jonathan Grunfeld. I'm a neurologist by training. May I ask you to use the mic because we slide the room. Ah, okay. I was simply asked not to make speak up too loud because of the problems of the noise going through these walls, but it's fine with me. So in any case, I'll repeat. We're doing a, a, a workshop, basically. And um, as I said, my name is Jonathan Grunfeld. I'm a neurologist by training. Subsequently, I had some training, a fellowship in neuro-oncology. For over 10 years, I've been doing palliative care, primarily in uh, the field of oncology, but I have seen some other patients in different contexts as well, as one could expect, as I am a trained neurologist. Um, no, I would like, first of all, to highlight some of the issues with which we are confronted in the field as physicians uh, who, for some reason or another, uh, think it's a reasonable idea to use uh, cannabis to alleviate various symptoms. Um, just a moment, I'll get a hold of this. So, first of all, I want to start with an example which can illustrate some of the difficulties we have uh, orienting towards the implementation of cannabis as a means of therapy of treatment in the standard world of institutional medicine. And there's an example, one of the issues we deal with, which is a good example, has to do with cancer-related cachexia. Why so? Because in this case, as opposed to many other cases, we have at least one single uh, attempt at performing a clinical trial, a randomized trial, in a well-established uh, manner. It was published in 2006. And they wanted to evaluate um, the effect after they became aware of the fact that there is some supportive preliminary data on the effect of cannabinoids uh, in cachexia. What they were referring to most of all were primarily uh, previous experience with Marinol, that is THC. Uh, cannabis and THC are not identical. I imagine that by now, after these couple of days, and perhaps even before that, we're all aw well aware of, that, of the difference. Um, so they planned a rigorously uh, designed randomized control, uh, control trial to evaluate the hypothesis uh, that cannabis can improve the appetite, first of all, and uh, affect, have a uh, beneficial effect on uh, quality of life as well. And they included patients with incurable advanced cancer and an involuntary weight loss uh, that is compatible with diagnosis of cachexia and notably a, a very short uh, uh, prognosed uh, life expectancy, which is significant, okay, because uh, we, know, we know that that can affect the uh, patient selection and subsequently the outcome. Okay, the performance status was also relatively low, to or below as a, uh, it was not considered for people who were still uh, reasonably functioning. And they uh, administered uh, extracts of cannabis, either containing THC alone or combined THC with CBD or placebo. And 
at a relatively, at a one standard dose for each one of those com combinations, 2.5 milligrams of THC with or without one milligram of CBD three times a day. And they followed the patients essentially for, uh, for a month and a half. And the outcome measures were a visual analog scale assessment of appetite and a standardized uh, score of uh, quality of life. And the, uh, this trial was uh, discontinued early because already during the interim analysis, it turned out that there was no difference between the groups. Okay? And uh, the accompanying committee uh, decided to discontinue the trial. And since then, we haven't had any other trials. We haven't had a critique of the findings of this trial. And on the other hand, I will present a letter that I received spontaneously from a patient of mine. Now, basically, I'm not representing all the experience. In terms of numbers, where, where I come from and what I represent is an experience with circa, let's say, 2,000 patients receiving cannabis who I personally have supervised over the last five years or so, five, six years. Um, but this, uh, all the data from all these uh, interventions has not been organized for uh, various reasons. Uh, that is something that can be discussed later on. But it, there is a major issue organizing data on cannabis when uh, the intervention is not standardized, you're using different preparations, different medical conditions, etc., etc., a very various population. In any case, quite frequently, not always by all means, but quite frequently you get dramatic responses to cannabis in the context of palliative care. And this is an example. So he sent this letter to me. And he wrote, this is originally in Hebrew because that's where I come from. I come from Israel. He wrote, two months ago I started feeling pain in the side of my body. The pain was accompanied by a loss of appetite and severe nausea. Just about every attempt to eat resulted in vomiting. Now, this letter is translated word for word, okay? I'm not... In interjecting any ideas, any opinions, any observations of my own. That is the reason I'm presenting it here. A comprehensive workup, he writes, discovered a malignant tumor in the liver. And now, at the moment, I added them now, yeah, I am being treated with pills for the pain. The pills also cause severe nausea and constipation, for which I am receiving an anti-nausea pill and a laxative, which unfortunately are not helping. And all I feel is fatigue and poor concentration and lack of interest. A strong urge to sleep all the time and a very low down mood. New paragraph. I wish to point out that until now, the only thing that made me feel much better was the use of cannabis. Physically, the body is less tense and less painful. The appetite increases, and I can eat anything without feeling full and choked up. I do not vomit at all. The mood and general feeling are much better without nausea or side effects. And his conclusion? Voluntary, uh, voluntarily offered by him was, the way I see it, the difference between the feelings with cannabis and without it is the difference between heaven and earth. That's an expression in Hebrew. Okay. And I guess the intention is clear. So, on the one hand, we have a rigorous study of cannabis for kechexia with a negative result. It was done the way uh, we have to perform uh, clinical studies. On the other hand, we have this report, and perhaps another one and another, 
and another one. But one is enough to bring to the surface the question, how can a physician confront a patient describing such a dramatic response and I mean, how should he respond to that? Should he say, okay, I, I accept uh, this description and I think that is reason enough to uh, recommend a trial with cannabis despite the lack of any well-established uh, scientific data? Or should I ignore this information, say it is not valid, and continue managing patients who have no alternative uh, beneficial intervention at their disposal. There's nothing else that can help them with this situation. They'll keep on getting the morphine <coughs> with the constipation and the nausea and feeling poorly in general and staying in bed and will not be able to uh, describe what this patient has described. So what do you think? Well, wh where do you stand? This, I think, is one of the issues that really touches on the point because doctors do not feel comfortable prescribing or recommending the use of cannabis. And then you have this patient and you have another patient who comes along and says, look doctor, I know you are not from the drug control, you're not from the Ministry of Interior, Secu Internal Security or whatever, I have used cannabis and it really transformed my life. When I took it, it was the first time that it was free of vomiting in months. And these are descriptions that I see. I, I receive such inputs from patients arriving in my office. Now, how should I respond? I don't know. What do you think about that? Yes. Because, I mean, that could be a methodological difference between the two studies, because obviously part of the problem could have been caused by, by opiates rather than, you know what I mean? So if in yeah. the study they didn't decrease the normal medication, that could explain the difference between the outcomes. Now, I haven't read mm -hmm. the paper, so I don't know, but yeah. that, that would be my, my suggestion. So in that case, I would obviously see the two cases as very different. Yeah, well, obviously there is a methodological difference, but what I'm trying to point out is that there is actually a difference in approach behind this, okay? Because I'm confronted with a patient who provides me with apparent primary data already verified that the cannabis is helpful for him, and usually these patients are rejected or ejected from the clinician's office saying, this is not a place to get cannabis. We are not drug dealers, full stop. And we are committed as f physicians to help these patients. Now, I wonder how, how you feel about it. And if a, if a patient like that would turn up in your office if you are physicians or would be under your care, how would you respond? I mean, how many would be in favor of authorizing uh, cannabis for such a patient? Okay, so, so you say it's a no-brainer, yeah. but still there are some people here who are, you simply don't care, take care of patients, is that the issue? Or you have your hesitations about uh, treating a patient under contemporary conditions. Obviously, if we ha would have more data, we could decide if there's something better to offer or uh, how to go about it, but as things stand now, this is uh, the option that we have. This is the option the patient has. So, that went back. Okay, so th there is this discrepancy and there are, there are doctors and there are patients and there is some kind of interface between them. And the doctor, unfortunately, is sandwiched somewhere between his commitments to the patient and his commitments to the medical institution, uh, the medical establishment the regulatory uh, powers that be who monitor him and dictate all kinds of things. 
and possibly he is uh, legally minded as well and doing his best to avoid any uh, indictments. So there are various forms of seeing a doctor. Sometimes, uh, you know, I try to find images of, of uh, patients with cancer and they were all smiling, of course. Very pleasant pictures. This one wasn't smiling anymore. And the only place I've succeeded in seeing a patient who is suffering is when they wanted to warn people against cigarettes. So there is this encounter, and I think a crucial point in uh, applying uh, cannabis as a treatment for palliative care patients is right, is the interface between the doctor. Most, the primary issue is actually not the science at this point, the science behind the use of uh, cannabis, for example. Just as the management in the management of patients with pain, providing other pain uh, analgesics, including opioids, is a minor part of the management in palliative care, from my perspective at least. You have to, you have to contact, establish a contact, uh, a report with the patient and everything, and then there is this technical issue of giving him five or ten or how ma however many milligrams of this or that preparation and it will work. So, in this interface, th what, what happens commonly is some kind of a discourse, and this, uh, I try to represent um, a stereoty stereotype uh, meeting between uh, the patient who comes demanding or requesting uh, cannabis and the doctor uh, in front of him. And the patient comes and the doctor says, there's no scientific evidence. And the patient says, but it works for me. The doctor does not feel comfortable. And these are things that happen in reality, in Israel, okay, where we have the authority to at least recommend the cannabis. Uh, I personally have the authority to issue the licenses as well which gave me a lot of leeway and enabled me to gain a lot of the clinical uh, hands-on experience. But the patient comes and says it works for me and the doctor says, tries to dissuade the patient. He says cannabis can cause you harm, can do all kinds of bad things. I've had patients come to me from other institutions reporting uh, that their mother, not the patient even, but the patient was too ill, she was at home lying in bed incapacitated by metastatic breast cancer and her son comes along and says well the doctor told her uh, I mean he said well do you want the cannabis to harm your brain you know it's possible that it can cause some harm to the brain cells and things like that which I doubt the doctor believed but it was just another way of convincing the patient that he is not interested in, in supporting uh, uh, any use of cannabis to alleviate the pain and other symptoms. So he says, cannabis can cause you harm. And the patient is no fool. He says, yeah, but so can other drugs. And they often point out how, um, how many difficulties they have with, with the opioids, for example, uh, with all the side effects that whoever works in palliative care is well acquainted with. And, you know, they say, the doctor says, but still, you know, these other drugs, maybe they have side effects, but they've been tested. We're using them in a scientific way, okay? We're, we have the data. We know that we are causing these and these problems, but we have data, so we can tell him that the chances that they will develop constipation are so and so many percent, let us say, in a good case. And all the other drugs all have r remarkable side effects. I mean, steroids is, a, uh, is an outstanding example, okay? So you help the patient not vomit, but then he can't sleep through all the night, and he's irritated and fighting with everybody about, around him, not be able, being able to withhold his, his uh, outbursts of anger and despair, or just becomes depressed. And the patient says the same. He says, but still, they, these other medications for which you have all these scientific data, they cause more harm than cannabis. Um, doctor, of course, has his authority and he insists that the patients 
should not uh, just listen to uh, lay opinions. Because many of the patients come in with recommendations or experience uh, from, from their neighborhood. You know, they are not necessarily grown up to listen only to doctors. They say, yeah, but my neighbor uh, had, had a fentanyl patch, my f neighbor had uh, a puff of uh, cannabis, and that's what helped them. And the doctor can listen, it's no shame. And if they look something up on the internet, so much the better. Okay, they're involved in their treatment. There'll be less problems with what they call nowadays adherence to the recommendations. They'll comply if it makes sense to them. Okay, and the doctor, and then after that, the patient will say, I don't know, but still, I feel good after taking the cannabis. Is that legitimate? The doctor say, thinks it is not all that legitimate, legitimate. And I've had patients come in and report that the doctor told them things in the, in the, that are more or less like, you know, of course you feel good. That's exactly why you want me to prescribe the uh, cannabis to begin with. And then you, of course, you wonder why are they prescribing uh, escitalopram, why are they prescribing uh, benzodiazepines, is that to make the patient feel poorly? Obviously not. And the patient says that. He, say, he says, still, I cannot see what's wrong with that. And then comes the, the moment, if the doctor can get, cannot get the patient out of, out of the office with all these excuses, he may become violent. He simply tells the patient, no matter what, this is not a, a point for a distribution, a distribution of drugs, and um, will you please leave my office? And that's it. And the doctor is frustrated. The patient is also frustrated, and he remains without any treatment at his disposal. So, and obviously we can see that the... Uh, I think the major issue the doctors have are not scientific. They are not scientifically established. They say we do not recommend cannabis because they feel they have a feel of some kind of discomfort. I don't know how you perceive it, and it's interesting for me to you, to hear if that is your perception as well. Uh, in France, uh, in France, uh, we are in front of a different problem. Uh, there are also people like that. I'm not a drug dealer, and we, are, we were confronted with that also with buprenorphine and methadone experience. It was exactly the same argument, exactly perfectly explained there. And with cannabis now, we have some doctors like that. But we have also a lot of doctors, including in oncology, a lot of specialists, who uh, say, I, now we are off. I'm not doctor, you're not patient. But I recommend you the use of cannabis. Speak with your son and find some. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't want to give you a prescription. And now with the new European system, a French doctor can make a prescription of bedrocam, for example. But they don't want to do it because I'm not a drug dealer. But go to the drug dealer, it's good for you. This is exactly the paradox we have in France now. Some, some even big specialists of oncology are for the use of, of medical cannabis because of all the testimonies, but they don't take any risk to help the patient to have the medicine, and they don't want to make prescriptions. It will taint their prestige, their professional prestige, yeah. something of the sort. Yeah. Is it? Yes. I thank you very much for your really interesting uh, introduction and I recognize in that this um, way of argumenting we sometimes use even if I think in I'm speaking for, uh, from Czech Republic experience uh, my feeling is that what is the issue now really now the days are that the uh, officially and legally prescribed cannabis is much more expensive for the patient than those uh, if he buys it uh, in the street. So, and uh, it's my experience, I am a palliative care consultant, so we have the legal rules how to prescribe it legally, how to obtain it in the pharmacy, how to use it, 
but it's three times more expensive that, uh, than if he buys uh, the joints, the comparable amount, even obviously what he buys in the street, it's uh, not, uh, well, we don't know the composition, the container of uh, the components is not known, but in principle, what I resolve is this uh, cost issue. If, and this, this is what sometimes hinders me uh, to recommend the medicine. I, um, I really uh, appreciate when you share, or if you share with uh, us your experience with 2,000 patients, or I have the experience with some 20 patients. Uh, and, but my uh, experience is that it's not a panacea, it's not a treatment uh, of, for all problems of advanced cancer patients. And the issue is, and it's perhaps the scientific question, just how to r recognize the patient who would benefit from it. And it would be perhaps my question if I can ask uh, in pain management or in symptom management, we often speak about this so-called number needed to treat. Uh, that means how many patients do you have to treat to achieve uh, the, the uh, really clinically meaningful NNT, benefit, yeah. NNT. So according to your experience with these 2,000 uh, cannabis treated patients, what is the NNT uh, palliative meaningful uh, benefit? It's difficult to tell, of course. First, because I don't have the data recorded, so it would be just a, a very crude assessment. The second thing is that there is a great assortment of symptoms which respond to cannabis, despite the fact, the obvious fact, that it is not a panacea. But it does impact a broad spectrum of symptoms, which makes it actually ideal for use, especially in palliative care, and on top of that, the context of palliative care is much less demanding in terms of a scientific uh, establishment of the efficacy and so on. I mean, we can titrate the, the, the treatment to the response of the patient, and we rely on that. Actually, we do it with other drugs as well, but uh, the context of, of Palliative care is obviously very useful for that. I'll just move on because, yeah. Um, you mentioned the costs being very high here. Um, today, when producing large amounts of medical cannabis, the price is very much cheaper than the street value. In Israel, we provide patients with uh, two, $2, dollars. that's 1.5 euros a gram. Um, and here, uh, Bedrocan has, uh, has monopolized on the import. They import cannabis at nine euros a gram, which is three euros above the market. Uh, and when they go to the tenders, they underbid everyone at uh, two euros a gram um, to, to beat the market. So obviously they can grow it for cheap, but they choose to overprice it. Why? We, I do not know, but they do that, and that's why the medicine here is expensive. But once the government here regulates growing, the price of cannabis should not be more than three, two to three euros a gram. And at that point, it gives doctors the, the freedom of, of being able to prescribe and treat patients. And the problem isn't necessarily with the cost of cannabis. It's the, the people growing it wanting to monopolize and make a lot of money, uh, charging nine euros a gram in because it's brought from Bedrocan, it, yeah, because Bedrocan sells it for nine euros. We, we brought the, the cannabis in. We bought it for nine from Bedrocan, brought it here. The taxes and the transportation brought it to 11, and we put it in the pharmacy with no profit. So we didn't make anything. Bedrocan made nine euros, and it's expensive. And when we want to grow it here, we should be able to grow it. They could grow it in Bedrocan for cheaper, but they choose to ask for an extraordinary amount of money. And it's also the reason why they went down from 4,000 patients to 1,200 patients in Holland, because they want very high prices. I, I, in Israel, the prices don't go above $2. That's a dollar fifty euros, 150 euros a gram, and that's affordable, and that's good care. Yeah. There are two things, at least, that I should mention. One, that I skipped over uh, the, the, the disclosures, and uh, this meeting is sponsored by Better, okay? And I have also 
had some provided some lectures for Pfizer some time a, a long while ago, and I am associated with another company that is also involved uh, in sort of apparatus for for cannabis. Uh, but uh, I have no formal association with them. Um, the second thing is, uh, as far as costs are concerned, you know, th this is really taking the role of the doctor a bit beyond because we are concerned not just in finding out what is appropriate for the patient, we also want to make sure that he can receive what we recommend and that to increase the chances that he will stick to it. Um, so, I don't know how the system works here in Czech, but patients spend money on other medications as well. And many of these medications are spared once they start using cannabis. Um, I can give you some examples uh, I, uh, that can bring us over into another context as well. Um, one of my patients, uh, gastrointestinal cancer, and on top of that, uh, severe cervical stenosis. He's suffering of pain, no doubt. Unfortunately, he was a drug addict many years ago. And he has a whole habitus of a drug addict. Okay? When I first saw him, he was taking 180 milligrams of the oxycodone every day. He was locked up at home, had a poor relationship with his female partner, was not going out to see people, was not working, nothing. Smoking a lot of cigarettes, something like two packs a day. Today, he uses cannabis. He doesn't touch oxycodone, this so-called drug addict. He was, through and through, a classic drug addict. He does not use one milligram of opioids. He stopped smoking. He's getting along better with his female partner. He, he leaves his house, walks outside, and uh, does an uh, occasional job here and there. Now, you know, this has something to do with, uh, with the whole process of uh, introducing cannabis into treatment by n partnering with a patient. And that is actually something that I, I, I thought of sparing for, for the next session I have. Um, so maybe I will spare it, <laughs> otherwise I won't have anything to say. In any case, there, there is an issue of negotiating with the patient, and I think this is another aspect uh, that we have to take into consideration, really the connection between the doctor and the patient. Once we send the patient off and tell, him, uh, tell the patient that uh, we are not uh, drug dealers, we are... Uh, disrespecting the patient, and we obviously do not trust him. The patient, on the other hand, has no reason to respect us, and obviously not to trust us. Um, it goes even further than that, because what actually happens is that these patients become alienated from professional doctors, because they know from their own experience what does good for them. They know it and the doctor does apparently not know it or will not uh, behave accordingly. And then the, doctor, the patient says, well, you know, this doctor, he doesn't know anything. I cannot rely on him. I know what is good for me. I have experienced it. The mistrust that you have there is the core of failure in palliative care or whatever. This is the, this is the essence of palliative care. Okay. So... Um, so mutual trust and respect are definitely fundamental. Um, and they also enable the clinical use of cannabis, and that's how I got into it to begin with, because I had no ideology regarding cannabis one way or the other. I was a neurologist, and I encountered a patient who was not a cancer patient, who had taken cannabis, and his life was transformed within a day. He was a stroke patient, he had spasticity, he had pain, he had consecutive panic attacks. Okay. He received the cannabis 
And the next day, his wife blessed me on the telephone. I did not call her up and to ask her how he's doing. She called up on her initiative, called me and said, this is wonderful. I haven't seen him like in this form in years. And he has been continuously taking it for six years already and has a relatively better life after having failed 18 different psychiatric drugs, uh, drug regimens uh, to manage his panic attacks. This also brings another issue to mind, and that is also why I mentioned the, the drug addict before, because we have certain rules about whom to prescribe and how to prescribe, and the normal thing would be drug addicts, if someone ever was a drug addict, he's not going to get a, a permit for cannabis. He's, he's illegible up front. He is not going to get the cannabis. Those are the rules. Um, and the same with anxiety. If someone has panic attacks, they would say anybody who with a history of panic attacks will not receive cannabis because this is a likely side effect of cannabis and you don't want to trans make his situation more difficult. But when you collaborate with the patient and you have trust and you know that generally speaking the effect is transient and not organically damaging, you give him the chance and you observe a benefit. So it is not scientific, but we have alternatives. As we said before, we can either abandon the patient or do something that is not exactly in line with our professional code as it is formulated uh, uh, by the establishment. Um, and, you know, I, I'm a clinician, as I said, and uh, what I rely on is really the, the direct titration of the symptoms of the patient in a face-to-face -face encounter. Um, and it is effective. Um, it is effective not only in that letter, uh, in the case of the patient who, who sent me that letter, is, uh, it is effective across the board. Some of the patients discover that it is not useful for them and they don't continue using it. Um, I mean, the key enabling, uh, the key factor that is, enables us to use cannabis in this form is that it really has ultimately a very safe profile. It is true that people can become uh, uncoordinated and confused and they can be stoned and lie in bed. You know, there is a report of an overdose of a lady. It was reported in uh, a journal of palliative care, I think, but I'm not sure, uh, by Van Hasselt is the name of the, uh, the report. Uh, the, the clinician who reported it, reports a daughter who, who treated her mother with uh, a cannabis extract. The mother was with uh, lung cancer in Holland, and the daughter went out and got this concentrate for the mother. And the mother uh, received a high dose, and she was stoned. She lay, just lay there and couldn't talk or do much. Now in the report she's described to be in a coma. She was brought to the hospital. Her blood pressure was normal. Her temperature was normal. Her, she was slightly uh, tachycardic. A hundred, she didn't get over 110. But, and she was discharged the next day from the hospital on her feet without any damage whatsoever. Okay. But she is still reported as a severe adverse event. She was in a coma. Um, the concentration they found in her uh, serum was about a hundred times the concentration that is believed to uh, be uh, the threshold for a uh, high, for a psychotropic uh, effect. So a hundredfold overdose. 
and she walked out of the hospital safe, on her own feet, without any damage, within 24 hours. Now, this was presented in the literature as an example of the dangers that we have with using cannabis. Depends on your point of view. On the other hand, show me another drug that you can overdose by a hundredfold and have the people walk out of the hospital within 24 hours. Yes, definitely. Uh, because this, the, uh, the scenario that you're presenting is that the obstacle is mainly um, with the doctors, that the doctors are reluctant to, to recommend or to prescribe. But do you have any experience with the opposite scenario, that, that you offer cannabis to a patient, but they say, oh, but are you a drug dealer or are you a charlatan? Why are you offering me uh, some herbal therapy? I don't trust yeah. you. Because the, the fact of the trust, I mean, it can work both ways, where even if you are convinced that this is going to help, or it can help the patient, the patient may actually lose trust because you're offering something that doesn't really look scientifically uh, solid. So do you have an experience with that? Definitely. Well, we have a slight advantage in Israel because there's a lot of publicity for the medical use of cannabis nowadays. Still, many people are wary of it and will not approach it. And that has to do with really the hands-on experience, how to deal with it vis-a-vis -vis the patient. And there is an issue with what is known as nocebo. Nocebo is a concept which is, interestingly, is not well known to doctors. Doctors know all about placebo. When you say nocebo, then the doctors say, well, I haven't heard that concept in medical school. Um, nocebo is just the inverse. Okay, you give someone uh, a pseudo drug, which is supposed to be associated with all kinds of adverse events, and they become a, and these individuals who receive this non-drug containing preparation manifest these adverse events, and this happens with cannabis as well. So we have the inverse. Generally, negotiating the whole issue of cannabis with the patients really has to do with that statement, you know, cannabis is not a panacea, and we have to sort of manage ourselves between extremes because expectations may go very high, and that, of course, uh, leads us to disappointment. And I have had patients return to me and saying, I'm very disappointed. Uh, and then I ask them, how come? They say, well, I say, but look, before you were taking such an amount of opioids, now you're taking half, right? He says, yeah. And now you're sleeping through the night. Before that, you were not sleeping through the night. True. And yet you are disappointed. And then they say, yeah, but I expected more than that. Okay? So we have to prepare these patients to explain that, you know, it has benefits, but we live in reality. It's not going to blast you out into uh, a different reality and, and make you 18 years old and healthy. Um, it's interesting, you know, one of the experiences with all these patients is that uh, cannabis has a very interesting way of uh, affecting uh, the patients. It sort of detours perception. So you really can have people taking cannabis. Everybody around can tell that they're doing better, but they are not aware of it. Somehow they do not become aware of the effect that cannabis has on them until other people remark on it. Um, I cannot explain it, but it is, it is a consistent observation. I hope you will have your own experience one day if you don't have yet. Um, how much you have pressure from the hospital to give or not to give a prescription? And that's one question. And second, um, how you're afraid from side effect, mainly with chemotherapy, if it's interfere or not interfere with the chemotherapy? 
Um, with chemotherapy, it's, look, we are dealing primarily with palliative care patients. Often, it is quite questionable uh, to provide these patients with chemotherapy to begin with. It is just sort of a last stand because the doctors don't know how to face their patients and discuss their plight. And then they say, well, we'll just go on treating because we're going to save you. And the patients say, well, you know, will I be healed? And the doctor sort of hesitates. And that, that is the context of palliative care. So the issue, I mean, to maximize the effect of, of a drug, essentially we are not aware of such problems. Where I have encountered problems with uh, cannabis is something that most people are not aware of. Cannabis is a mau inhibitor, okay? It inhibits reuptake of monoamines. Obviously, you would not want to give it with all kinds of SSRIs. And the way that I became aware of that is that I had an elderly patient and another patient and another patient who had a sort of paradoxical response to cannabis, you know, the same uh, species that usually was effective, all of, a, all of a sudden made them agitated. And um, I, somehow I, I decided to decrease the antidepressant uh, dosage and they recovered. Uh, these are not, not frequent in occurrences and these are not occurrences that have been reported. But there is a logic to a physiological logic to it, and I think it is something to take care. So I personally am quite wary uh, of uh, providing uh, high doses of uh, cannabis together with SSRIs or SNRIs. I try to avoid it, and when I do, I am with my hands, uh, hands on, following the patient very intensely. And if I have any suggestion that they're, uh, that, that they're responding. In that manner, then I decrease the, the dose of the uh, SNRIs. Uh, I must say that uh, in the context of palliative care, in Israel at least, there is a very loose approach to the use of SSRIs and SNRIs. You know, the patient, the, the, the doctor sees the patient and feels uncomfortable and then provides the patient the drug to soothe himself in a sense uh, because you know, they don't wait to control the pain and then give the SSRI. Often, if patients are suffering of pain or other symptoms, they will appear to an untrained eye as depressed, but they are not. They are simply suffering, and if you alleviate the suffering, then they'll be perfectly normal in terms of their mood fluctuations. Um, so th there is this... Uh, this, uh, you know, the doctors uh, adhere to the concept of uh, evidence-based medicine. That is, you know, it's always a very handy sort of argument. They say, no, there's no science to it. Um, but the point is that evidence-based medicine is con uh, constantly being misinterpreted by the, uh, the public of the doctors. I mean, we are all aware of it. Most of the therapies we have to offer, most of the dis clinical decisions we make are not necessarily based on randomized controlled double-blind studies because there are so many variations in the circumstances and only a few of those patients would have even been included in such trials had they been performed by the according to the inclusion-exclusion criteria. And uh, the, uh, the specialists who deal with evidence-based medicine, even to begin with, saw the component of information coming from such trials only as one element in their considerations. You have your personal experience, you have the patient feedback, you have the expertise, These you have some knowledge of the physiology and the pharmacology, these schemes all come in and combine to help you arrive at a decision. But those doctors who are legally bent and so on, they say, look, these are the guidelines, 
And every guideline I am aware of in evidence-based medicine says, ultimately, these are just recommendations, but the physician in the field should make his own decision. But that last sentence is often disregarded by, the, by those who argue, let's say, against the use of cannabis. They, they'll say there are no randomized, con there's no scientific evidence, and they will abandon, throw out the baby with the bathwater, so to speak, instead of accumulating more clinical experience and then improving it as they move along. Um, I'm going backwards and forwards all the time for some other reason. Okay, and here are some uh, question marks that I have. Um, so how can, how can we deal with these claims uh, regarding the medical uh, utility? I'm still sticking to that question. And I have repeated myself so, several times concerning the abandoning uh, the use of cannabis or identifying alternative sources of, uh, of legitimacy. And I think that the uh, position that the patient, that the doctor uh, takes vis-a-vis -vis the patient uh, can uh, guide him in his decision. I conclude here with another letter from patients which uh, is instructive uh, in the sense that it suggests the broad spectrum of impact that uh, cannabis has in the context of palliative care. Um, so this is a 65-year-old man who wrote to me of his own will. I came to you in a terrible psychological and physical state after difficult operations entailing the opening of the abdomen and the formation of a GI a gastrointestinal stoma. The side effects were terrible indeed, and associated with a very poor quality of life. Among the side effects, this is the way he formulated, okay? So if there are any gaps here that we have to fill in, we can. Um, but in general, he, he mentions a whole host of uh, side effects, including poor control of the sphincters, some of which were resected in the operation because he had anal cancer. Uh, uh, with uh, poor control, fecal incontinence. Uh, of course, he lives in reality, so he was also exposed to a traumatic event of his own son committing suicide, and he had difficulty uh, coping with life due to uh, that event as well. He had eczema on his hands. He used cannabis uh, to uh, rub in on his hands and that alleviated the, the uh, eczema because there are multiple aspects uh, of, of cannabis in, w in which uh, ways in which it can be implemented uh, to help. Um, he also suffered of diabetes treated with the insulin and he says I have gone down to zero medicines, zero insulin. Blood tests demonstrate normal glucose values. And he's not the only patient. Okay, so we are not in the position to use cannabis now as a treatment for diabetes. But we, knew, we have enough raw data to say that if a patient comes and reports um, an improvement in his metab metabolic status, it definitely can be associated with the use of cannabis. And here he comes and tells me that. Just last week I had a patient come in with a thymoma and myasthenia gravis, which is an autoimmune disease, commonly treated with steroids for very long term. And he was uh, started using uh, cannabis when his uh, hemoglobin A1C levels were about 15 on treatment with steroids. 
and he still had a remainder of the uh, the thymoma which could uh, could not be completely rejected uh, um, resected after three months he came back to his doctor and his doctor did not believe his eyes he had a hemoglobin a1c of 5.2 he was using half the amount of the steroids and was feeling better for one reason or another with regard to the control of the symptoms of myasthenia. He also reports that the thymoma is somewhat smaller according to the measurements on the uh, imaging. This is anecdotal evidence. It is not something that I'm going to establish a recommendation on to treat all patients with myasthenia gravis and thymomas with cannabis. Okay. But um, still, I cannot uh, offhand reject his claims, and uh, there is no reason to. I can tell him, well, uh, you know, it, it, it's. I cannot tell him that it is not associated with cannabis treatment either. Okay, we simply say that we currently are not at the point to make any well-established recommendations, but. Uh, we have good reason to continue recommending the cannabis for him and prescribing it for him personally. He also had leg edema, severe edema. Both legs were swollen. Nothing helped. His, his, uh, I mean, he got diuretics, got everything. Nothing helped him against the edema. After starting using the, the cannabis, the edema resolved. Of course, there's this emotional uh, attachment that they have, okay? They attribute to the doctor all kinds of things that actually have been done by the, the cannabis, okay? Uh, of course, I know that I am a guardian angel, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, this is an important element of uh, palliative care to really establish a rapport with the patients and uh, respect their requests for cannabis if it makes sense to us. And the question really after all that is, can you make a list and tell us when yes and when no? Um, I'll, maybe I'll get back to that. Okay, and he says there's not wide enough canvas to contain all the changes that have occurred to me in all levels and he wants to translate his gratitude into words and that's why he wrote this letter. He, he was not a whole human being in the beginning and you he is actually talking to Mr. Cannabis, have returned my life to me. And this is an expression that you hear from many of the palliative care patients. Okay, So it is a very powerful intervention, and it is powerful not because of the intensity of my belief in its efficacy or not, and it is not powerful because of the scientific data or not. It is powerful in each and every case in terms of the transformation of the life of the patients who receive it. He notes that he has turned into an active and dynamic person, brisk and full of energy, losing 22 kilograms of weight. He was overweight and he lost the edema and he lost some of his belly. And this also has to do with hesitations people have to do, have with prescribing cannabis. Because first of all, the, the, it is common for physicians opposed to the use of, use of cannabis to evoke the whole issue of amotivational syndrome. And the fact is that people who are ill and receive cannabis, it may have something to do with the selection of the species, but still uh, become much, much more active in many senses. Um, As far as the weight loss, you know, they are always concerned with the, the munchies and the, the increase in appetite, but people who are overweight tend to lose weight when they're receiving cannabis. Um, another example, which is outstanding, I think, as far as energy is concerned, has to do with patients receiving uh, chemotherapy. And there are many such patients. And the most 
prominent side effect of most of these chemotherapeutic regimens is something that we do not how, know how to describe very clearly. We call it fatigue. People go home and they cannot raise themselves from the chair, from the bed. They cannot do anything. They do not have the power, the energy to do so. And that happens, let's say, with young women receiving chemotherapy for their breast cancer. They have no other disease. It is simply, simply that. And they are functioning mothers, wives, who cannot fulfill their duties or what they perceive as their duties, what they want to do for their family. They cannot go to work, they cannot care for their children, nothing. When they receive cannabis in that context, they keep on working, they keep on tending for their children throughout the chemotherapy, quite often. Am I talking, tell, telling you about a miracle? Possibly some of you have had this, this experience, but I think I mention it here to emphasize how significant this uh, impact on the energy people have uh, that can be associated with use of cannabis and contradicts all the reservations doctors have about the abulia uh, syndrome. Okay, and he changed his entire diet, of course, Enormous change for the better, virtually a slight experience of euphoria that decreases to a very minor degree for the regular smoker. Okay. And, well, this is the question that um, I started with and I am ending. This is not a scientific uh, session. It is, it is, as far as I understood, it's supposed to be a workshop. And it is something, has something to do with sharing the experience that I have, which I cannot organize methodically, because I have a great variety of patients of all ages, of many different diseases, receiving all kinds of cannabis preparations. Some of them are improvising on their own. There are some of them by the, uh, for example, they buy the flower buds and then extract oil on their own at home. Um, I am not the regulator going to go after them and tell them what to do and what not to do. But this is what happens in reality. I have patients whose children or grandchildren go out to the black market to buy all kinds of cannabinoid preparations of sorts mingling with an unpleasant uh, social milieu and spending a lot of money because in Israel cannabis, medical cannabis, cannabis especially is considered something good and goes for very high prices relatively. So they benefit from a receiving the cannabis for a price under the protection, under the auspices of the uh, health ministry. Um, on, on top of that, they spare the money on the, some of the medications. Those who smoke cigarettes often discontinue using the cigarettes, and that is one of the ways that I can convince them to uh, move on to using um, vaporizers, because the vaporizers also cost a lot of money. I say, well, you stop smoking for two months and you can buy three vaporizers, not just one. Okay, so um, these are the petty details which actually constitute the reality of caring for these patients when we are lucky enough to have the freedom to provide cannabis. Another thing that has to do perhaps with th that clinical trial that failed is that when you have a fixed dose and a notion of that sort and a selection of uh, patients who are very doing very poorly, you do not have the opportunity to treat them when they have more potential to respond to the treatment. And you are not titrating the, uh, the treatment. Because when I treat my patients, I titrate them. Take it. No good. Take a little more. No good. Take a little more. And there is a, there is a variety of species available for, for use in Israel. So I have had patients using one 
First of all, they use different, uh, it is common for them to use at least two different uh, species, one for daytime and another to go to sleep at night. And there are different issues. And there, there are, there is a discussion about the significance of species-specific uh, responses to cannabis. Okay. The general experience is that some species will induce more of an appetite, others will be more effective against nausea, other will uh, have a good impact on uh, spasticity, and the patients move from one to another, from one to another, until they identify the optimal uh, treatment, and then they stick to it. And patients do not like to feel drugged, stoned, or incapacitated by their treatment. That has to do with the respect and the trust. Um, I, I cannot imagine that people want to uh, cause themselves discomfort and deteriorate functionally. And I have the opportunity to work in such a flexible setting, which is not exactly compatible with the way medical strict institutional medicine is practiced, but it is more effective. Um, I don't know, you have any, any remarks, any questions? Um, yeah. I have a lot of demands coming in from hospital for the last week of life with people who are not able anymore to vaporize, to smoke or to eat also, a lot of problem, people with nausea, people with no more mm -hmm. need to, 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 they don't want to eat, in fact, even if they are appetite, they don't want, they say. And, but they appreciate the effect, the mood, and the control of the pain with cannabis. And in this case, uh, what forms of, uh, of medicine you use to, get, to deliver it to the, to the patient? Because they have a lot of uh, demand coming, for even for the hospital, because patients arriving with cannabis, and so uh, often it's weed, and uh, p the people in the hospital don't know how to deal it when the um, when the patient is too sick to vaporize or to smoke. Mm -hmm. and this is uh, a huge demand. Yeah. Well, well, there are several options. First of all, vaporization. Some of the vaporizers have bags which uh, you can use to actively pump the, the uh, vapor uh, when they are inhaling. Uh, suppositories, uh, oil, which is absorbed sublingually, is used commonly. And often they can smoke as well. It is incredibly effective in the end-of-life phase, which nowadays established medicine, to my knowledge, around the Western uh, cultural sphere, let's say, are receiving a whole lot of opioids towards the end of life. And they sort of gradually sink into a semi-coma, death rattle, um, absent. We do not know to what extent they are exposed to all kinds of horrifying uh, hallucinations. I remember when I was in the States doing my fellowship, entering the room of a patient who saw me enter the room through a wall of fire. Okay, She was terrified. I had a patient, one of those patients, one of those many patients who do not feel comfortable with our Western medicine. And she had already experienced uh, tr therapy for her breast cancer in the past. Then she was diagnosed with lung cancer. She didn't even want to have a, a biopsy because she said up front she's not going to have any chemo. And she insisted on that. Gradually, it was, became clear that it was a metastatic lung cancer, which progressed, and she was entered into an institution to die, end-of-life care. And she was on cannabinoids. She could not communicate with anyone, uh, on uh, opioids. She could not communicate with anyone. She was just lying there in bed, and they were all just waiting for her to die. And then her, uh, one of the members of her family came around and provided her, we uh, arranged a license to use cannabis and they uh, gave her uh, a joint. And she was wheeled out of the 
out of the room in which he was supposed to die and had a couple of puffs from the weed outside in the open and she opened her eyes and she welcomed her visitors and she lived on for another week without being groggy, hallucinating and apparently suffering. And then she passed away more peacefully and without that ugly end-of-life scenario many of us are acquainted with when uh, we use the standard medicine, uh, Western approach. Maybe to conclude, you know, I don't know how, uh, where we stand time-wise. We're, We're done. Okay, so just to conclude, I'll say the, over, the, the overall effect of the cannabis is really what is interesting and intriguing. Because you can alleviate one symptom and another and another and another. But when you give cannabis to a patient, you alter his emotional presence. And he, instead of being introverted and focused on his suffering, and this is, you know, it sounds very soft, but it is a concrete experience. You see again and again, they open up the patients and they become responsive to their social environment. They even are happy to receive guests. What dying palliative care patient is interested in seeing guests? You know, they just do their obligations, but they say, leave me alone, I want my peace. And all of a sudden, they interact with the people. And the whole family benefits for it. So you're not just treating the patient, you're treating the whole family with the cannabis. I don't know. That's a way to conclude this, <laughs> I guess. I don't know. Somewhat biased. But we all have our biases, and I admit them, but the experience is expressed in those letters by those who have received the cannabis. Those are not my words. <laughs>